Book 1, Chapter 20, Continuing with Verse 20. Oh, how one's youth is worn out with the thoughts of his mistress, her swollen breasts, her beautiful face, and her sweet caresses. The wise regard a young man afflicted with pain of soft desire as no better than a fragrant fragment of straw. Youth is the stake of haughty self-esteem, as the rack is for the immolation of the elephant, giddy with its frontal pearl. Youth is a lamentable forest, where the mind, as the root of all, gives growth to jungles of lovesick, grown sighs and tears of sorrow. The vices of this time are like venomous snakes in the forest. Know that a person's useful bloom resembles a blooming lotus of the lake. One is as full of affections, bad desires, and evil intents as the other is filled with bees, filaments, petals, and leaves. The new bloom of youth is the playground of anxiety and disease which, like two birds with their black and white plumage of vice and virtue, frequent the fountain of the young man's heart. Early youth resembles a deep sea, disturbed by the waves of numberless amusements, transgressing all bounds and regardless of death and disease. Youth is like a furious gust of wind, overloaded with the dust of pride and vanity, which sweeps away every trace of good qualities. The rude dust of the passion of youth disfigures their faces and the hurricanes of their sensualities cover their good qualities. Youthful vigor awakens a series of faults and destroys a group of good qualities by decreasing the vice of pleasures. Youthful bloom confines the fickle mind to some beautiful person, like bright moonbeams serve to trap the flitting bee in the dust of a closing lotus. Youth, like a delightful cluster of flowers growing in the garden of the human body, attracts the mind to it like a bee and makes it giddy with its sweets. The human mind, anxious to derive pleasure from the youthfulness of the body, falls into the cave of sensuality like a deer running after the mirage of desert heat falls down into a pit. I take no delight in moon-like youth, which gilds the dark body with its beams and resembles the stern mane of the lion-like mind. It is a surge in the ocean of our lives. There is no reliance upon youth that fades away as soon as summer flowers in this desert of the body. Like a bird, Youth soon flies away from our bodily cage. It is like the philosopher's stone that quickly disappears from the hands of the unfortunate. As youth advances to its highest pitch, so the feverish passions wax stronger for our destruction only. As long as the night delusion of youth lasts, the fiends of our passion rage in the desert of the body. Pity me, O sage, in this state of youth, which is so full of agitation, as to have deprived me of the sight of reason. O pity me as you would for your dying son, a foolish man who ignorantly rejoices at his transient youth is considered to be like a human beast. A foolish fellow who is fond of his youth 
flushed with pride and filled with arrows, soon comes to repent. Those who have safely passed over the perils of youth are great-minded men honored on earth. With ease, one can cross over a wide ocean that is the horrible home of huge whales. But it is hard to pass over our youth that is so full of vices and waves of our passions. It is very rare to have a happy youth filled with humility and spent in the company of respectable men. Such youth is distinguished by feelings of sympathy and is joined with good qualities and virtues. Chapter 21. The Denunciation of Women. Brahm added, what beauty is there in the body of a woman composed of nerves, bones, and joints? She is a mere statue of flesh and a frame of moving machinery with her ribs and limbs. Separated from its flesh, skin, blood, and water, can you find anything beautiful in the female form that is worth beholding? Then why don't upon it? This very frame, consisting of hair and blood, cannot engage the attention of a high-minded man to its blemishes. The bodies of females so covered with clothing and repeatedly smeared with paint and perfumes are in the end devoured by carnivorous beasts and worms. The breasts of women decorated with strings of pearl appear as charming as the pinnacles of Mount Sumeru, washed by the waters of the Ganges falling upon them. Look at these very same breasts in the end, having become a lump of food to be devoured by dogs in cemeteries and on the naked ground. There is no difference between a woman and a young elephant that lives in the jungle. Both are made of blood, flesh, and bones. Then why hunt after her? A woman is charming only for a short time. I look upon her merely as a cause of delusion. There is no difference between the wine and a woman. Both tend equally to produce high-flown mirth and jollity, creating revelry and lust. Overindulgent men are like chained elephants among mankind. They will never come to the sense, however, goaded by the hook of reason. Women are the flames of vice. Their black dyed eye and hair are their smoke and soot. Though pleasing to the sight, they are as intangible as fire. They burn a man like fire consumes straw. Though they appear soft and juicy to sight, they burn from afar and are as dry as bones. They serve as fuel for the fires of hell and they are dangerous with their charm. The women resemble a moonlit night veiled over by her loosened locks and looking through her starry eyes. She shows her moonlike face amidst her flowery smile. Her soft dalliances destroys all manly energy and her caresses overpower the good sense of men like the shade of night does the sleeping world. A woman is as lovely as a vine in its flowering time. Her palms are the leaves and her eyes are the black bees. Her breasts are like the uplifted tops of the plant. A lovely maiden is like a poisonous vine, fair as the filament of a flower, but by causing inebriation and unconsciousness, destructive of life. Like the snake catcher, entices the snake by its breath and brings it out of its hole. So does a woman allure a man by her meddlesome civilities and gets him under her control. 
sexual desire like a huntsman has spread his nets in the form of women for the purpose of ensnaring deluded men like silly birds. The mind of man, though as fierce as that of a furious elephant, is tied fast by the chain of love to the fulcrum of women. Just as an elephant is fastened to the post where it remains dull and dumb forever, human life is like a pool in which the mind moves about in mud and mire. Here it is caught by the bait of woman and dragged along by the thread of its impure desires. The beautiful eyed maiden is a bondage to man as the stable is to the horse the fastening post of the elephant, and as spells are to the snakes. The wonderful world with all its delights and enjoyments began with a woman and depends on women for its continence. A woman is a casket full of all gems of vice. She is the cause of our chain to everlasting misery and she is of no use to me. What shall I do with her breast, her eyes, her loins, her eyebrows, the substance of which is only flesh, and which therefore is altogether unsubstantial? Here and there, O Brahman, her flesh and blood and bones undergo a change for the worse in the course of a few days. Say as you can see these, those dearly beloved mistresses, so much fondled by foolish men, lying at last in the cemetery, their body parts all mangled and falling off. O oh, Brahman, whose dear love objects, the faces of maidens so fondly decorated by their lovers with paints and paste are at last to be burned on the pile. Their braided hairs hang like fly wisps on the cemetery trees. And after a few days, their whitened bones are strewn about like shining stars. Behold their blood sucked in by the dust of the earth, voracious beasts and worms feeding upon their flesh, jackals tearing their skin, and their vital air dispersed in the vacuum. This is the state to which the members of the female body must shortly come to pass. You say all existence is delusion, therefore tell me, why do you allow yourselves to fall into error? A woman is nothing but a form composed of five elements. So why should intelligent men be fondly attached to her? Men's longing for women is like the suit of vine, which stretches its sprigs to a great length, but bears plenty of bitter and sour fruit. A man blinded by greed for his mate is like a deer that has strayed from its herd, not knowing which way to go, lost in the maze of illusion. A young man under the control of a young woman is as lamentable as an elephant in pursuit of his mate that has fallen into a pit of Vindhya Mountain. He who has a wife has an appetite for enjoyment on earth but one without her has no object of desire. Abandonment of life, of wife, amounts to abandonment of the world. And forsaking the world is the path to true happiness. I'm not content, O Brahman, with these unmanageable enjoyments, which are as flickering as the wings of bees and are soon at an end as they are born. From my fear of repeated births and decay and death, I long only for the state of supreme bliss. Denunciation of old age, Rama speaking. Boyhood has scarcely lost its boyishness when it is overtaken by youth, which is soon followed by a ruthless old age that devours the other two. Old age withers the body like frost, freezing a lake of lilies. It drives away the beauty of the body like a storm does autumn clouds. It pulls down the body into a current 
carries away a tree from the bank. As an old man with his limbs slackened and worn out by age, his body weakened by infirmity, is treated by women as a useless beast. Old age drives away a man's good sense, just like a stepmother drives away a good one. A man in tottering old age is ridiculed as an imbecile by his own sons and servants, and even by his wife, friends, and relations. When their appearance grows uncouth and their bodies become helpless and devoid of all manly qualities and powers, then insatiable greed alights on the heads of the aged like a greedy vulture. Appetite, the constant companion of my youth, is thriving along with my age, accompanied by her evils of indigence and heart-burning cares and restlessness. Ah me, what must I do to remove my present and future pains? This fear increases with old age and finds no remedy. What am I that I am brought to this extremity of senselessness? What can I do in this state? I must remain dumb and silent. Given these reflections, there is an increased sense of helplessness in old age. How and when and what shall I eat and what is sweet to taste? These are the thoughts that trouble the mind when old age comes. There is an insatiable desire for enjoyments, but the powers to enjoy them are lacking. There is a lack of strength which afflicts the body in old age. Hoary old age sits and shrieks like a heron on the top of the tree of the body, which is infested within by the serpents of sickness. As the grave owl, the bird of night, appears unexpectedly to our sight in the evening shades over the landscape, so the solemn appearance of death overtakes us in the eve of our life. As darkness prevails over the world in the evening, so death overtakes the body at the eve of the life. Death overtakes a man in his hoary old age. Just like a monkey alights on a tree covered with pearly flowers. Even a deserted city, a leafless tree, and parched up land may present a fair aspect, but never does the body look well that is pulled down by hoary age. Old age with its whooping cough lays hold of a man just as a vulture seizes its prey with loud shrieks in order to devour it. As a girl eagerly lays hold of a lowest flower wherever she sees one, then plucks it from its stalk and tears it to pieces, so does old age overtake a body's person's body and breaks it down at last. As the chill blast of winter shades a tree and covers its leaves with dust, so does old age seize the body with a tremor and fill all its limbs with the rust of diseases. The body overtaken by old age becomes as pale and battered as a lotus flower beaten by frost becomes withered and shattered as moonbeams contribute to the growth of kumunda flowers on the top of mountains, so does old age produce gray hairs resembling cassia flowers on the heads of men with the inward plenum and gout. Death, the Lord of all beings, views the gray head of a man as a ripe pumpkin seasoned with the salt of old age and devours it with the zest. As the Ganges upsets a neighboring tree by its rapid course, so old age destroys the body as the current of our life runs fast to decay. Old age preys on the flesh of the human body and takes as much delight in devouring its youthful blooms as a cat does, feeding on a mouse. Discrepitude raises its 
ominous hoarse sound of hiccup in the body like a jackal, sending forth her hideous cry in the forest. Old age is an inner flame that consumes the living body like a wet log of wood, which thereupon emits its hissing sounds of hiccup and hard breathing and sends up the gloomy fumes of sorrow and sighs. The body, like a flowering vine, bends down under the pressure of age, turns to gray like the fading leaves of a plant, and becomes as lean and thin as a plant after its flowering time is over. Like an infuriated elephant that can uproot a white plantain tree in a moment, so does old age destroy the body and becomes as white as camphor all over. The nullity, old age, as it is the standard bearer of the king of death, flapping his fly with gray hairs before him and bringing an army of diseases and troubles in his train. The monster of old age will even overcome those who were never defeated in wars by their enemies and those who hide themselves in the inaccessible caverns of the mountain. As infants cannot play in a room that has become cold with snow, so the senses can have no play in a body stricken with age. Old age, like a juggling girl, struts on three legs at the sound of popping and whiffing, beating like a kettle drum on both sides. The tuft of gray hairs on the head of an aged body represents a fly whisk last fastened to the top of a handle of white sandalwood that serves to become the despot of death. As hoary age makes its advance like moonlight over the body, he calls forth hidden death to come out of it as the moonlight makes water lilies unfold their buds. Again, as the white watch of old age whitens the outer body, so debility, disease, and dangers become its inmates in the inner apartment. The extinction of being as preceded by old age, therefore, I am a man of little understanding and can have no reliance in old age, though extolled by some. What then is the good of the miserable life which lives subject to old age? Senility is irresistible in this world and it defies all efforts to avoid or overcome it. Chapter 23, The Vicissitudes of Time. From speaking. By their much idle talk, ever doubting skepticism and schism, men of little understanding are found to fall into grave errors in this pit of the world. Good people can have no more confidence in the network of their ribs than little children like fruit reflected in a mirror. Time is a rat that gnaws off the threads of all thoughts that men may entertain about the contemptible pleasures of this world. There is nothing in this world which the all-devouring time will spare. He devours all things like an undersea fire consumes the overflowing sea. Time is the sovereign Lord of all and equally terrible to all things. He is ever ready to devour all visible beings. Time is master of all, spares not even the greatest of us for the moment. He swallows the universe within himself, whence he is known as the universal soul. Time pervades all things, but has no perceptible feature of its own, except that 
he is imperfectly known by the name of years, ages, and millennia, calpos. All that was fair and good, and as great as Mount Meru, has gone down under the womb of eternity, like snakes, gorged by the greedy Garuda. There was no one ever so unkind, hard-hearted, cruel, harsh, or miserly, whom time has not devoured. Time is ever greedy, even when he devours mountains. This great garment is not satisfied with gorging himself with everything in all the world. Time, like an actor, plays many parts on the stage of the world like abstractions, kills, produces, and devours, but at last destroys everything. Time is constantly picking up the seeds of all four kinds of living beings from this unreal world, like a parrot picks up ripened fruit from under the cracked shell of pomegranate and nibble at its seed. Time uproots all proud living beings in this world like an elephant uses its tusk to pull up the trees of the forest. This creation of God is like a forest, having Brahma for its foundation and its trees full of the great fruits of God's. Time commands this creation throughout its length and breadth. Time glides along constantly as a creeping plant. Its parts composed of years and ages and the dark nights like black bees chasing after them. Time, O oh sage, is the subtlest of all things. It is divided, though indivisible. It is consumed, though incombustible. It is perceived, though imperceptible in its nature. Time, like the mind, is strong enough to create and demolish anything in a trice. And its province is equally extensive. Time is a whirlpool to men, and man, being accompanied with desire, is insatiable and uncontrollable mistress, and delighting in illicit enjoyment. Time makes him do and undo the same thing over and over again. Time is prompted by his rapacity to appropriate everything for himself. From the meanest straw, dust, leaves, and worms to the greatest Indra and Mount Meru itself. Time is the source of all malice and greed and the spring of all misfortunes and cause of intolerable fluctuations of our states. As children play with balls in a playground, so does time play with his two balls of the sun and moon in his arena of the sky. Upon the end of a Kalpa age, time will dance about with the bones of the dead hanging like a long chain from its neck to the feet. At the end of a Kalpa age, the gale of desolation rising from the body of this world destroys, destroyer causes fragments of Mount Meru to fly about in the air like the rhymes of the Boja Patera tree. Time then assumes his terrific form of fire to dissolve the world in empty space, and the gods, Brahma and Indra and all others cease to exist. As the sea shows himself in a continued series of waves, rising and falling, one after another, so it is time that creates and dissolves the world. and appears to rise and fall with the rotation of days and nights. 
At end of the world, time plucks the gods and demigods from the great tree of existence, like ripe fruit. Time resembles a large sacred fig tree, Ficus religiosa, studied with all the world and is, as its fruit, resonant with the noise of living beings like the hissing of gnats. Time, accompanied by actions, as his mate, entertains himself in the garden of the world, blossoming with the moonbeams of the divine spirit. As the high and huge rock supports its body upon the earth, so does time rest itself in endless and interminable eternity. Time assumes to himself the various colors of black and white and red, all night, day, and midday, which serve for his vestures. As the earth supports the great hills that are fixed upon it, so time supports all the innumerable ponderous worlds that constitute the universe. Hundreds of great Kalpa ages may pass away, yet there is nothing that can move eternity to pity or concern, or stop or expedite his course. Neither sets nor rises. Time is never proud to think that it is he who, without the least sense of pain or labor, brings this world into play and makes it exist. Time's like a reservoir in which the nights are mud and the days lotuses and the clouds bees. As a covetous man, with worn out broomstick in hand, sweeps over a mountain to gather particles of gold strewn over it. So does time with the sweeping course of days and nights collect all living beings in the world as one mass of the dead. As a miserly man trims and lights a lamp with his own fingers in order to look for his stores in each corner of his room, so does time light the lamps of the sun and moon to look for living beings in every nook and corner of the world. As one ripens raw fruit in the sun and fire in order to devour them, so does time ripen men by their sun and fire worship to bring them under its jaws at last. The world is a dilapidated cottage of men, and men of parts are rare gems in it. Time hides them in the casket of his belly as a miser keeps his treasure in a coffer. Good men are like a garland of gems which, put on time, which time puts on its head for a time with fondness and then tears and tramples it down. Strings of days and nights and stars resembling beads and bracelets of white and black lotuses are continually turning about around the arm of time. Time looks upon the world like a carcass of a ram, with its mountains, sea, sky, and earth as its four horns and the stars as its drops of blood, which it drinks day by day. Time destroys youth as a moon shuts the petals of the lotus. It destroys life like a lion kills the elephant. There is nothing so insignificant that time does not steal. After sporting for a Kalpa period in the act of killing and crushing of all living beings, time comes to lose its own existence and becomes extinct in the eternity of the spirit of spirits. After a short rest and respite, time reappears as the creator, preserver, and destroyer of all who remembers all.
He shows the shapes of all things, whether good or bad, keeping his own nature beyond the knowledge of all. Thus does time expand and preserve and finally dissolve all things of ways for. Chapter 24, The Ravages of Time, Ram continues. Time is a self-willed sportsman, like a prince who is inaccessible to dangers and whose powers are unlimited. This world is like a forest and a sporting ground of time where the poor deluded whirlings are caught in his snare like bodies of wounded stay. The ocean of universal deluge is merely a pleasure pond for time and its undersea fires bursting there are merely lotus flowers. Time makes his breakfast of this vapid and stale earth, flavored with the milk and curd of the seas of those names. His wife, Chandi, with her train of matris, the furies, ranges all around this wide world like a ferocious tigress. The earth with her waters is like a bowl of wine in the hand of time, dressed and flavored with all sorts of lilies and lotuses. In the hand of time, the lion with its huge body, startling mane, loud, roaring, and tremendous groans, seems like a caged bird of sport. Makala, transcendent time, like a playful young cuckoo, appears in the figure of the blue autumn sky, warbling as sweet as the notes of a lute of gourd in the music of the spheres. The restless bow of death is found flinging its sorrowful arrows with ceaseless thunderclaps on all sides. This world is like a forest in which sorrows rage about like playful apes and time, like a sportive prince in this ocean is now wandering, now walking, now playing and now killing his game. Chapter 25, The Play of Death. Time stands the foremost of all deceitful players in this world. He acts the double parts of creation and destruction and of action and faith. The existence of time is known to us only through action and motion, which binds all beings in the succession of thoughts and acts. Fate is that which frustrates the acts of all created beings. Like the heat of the sun serves to dissolve a snowpack. This wide world is the stage on which the giddy mob dances about in their appointed time. Time is a third name of a terrifying nature known as Krutanda, fate, who is the form of a Kapalika, one holding human skulls in his hand, dances about in the world. This dancing and loving Krutataha, fate, is accompanied by his consort called destiny, to whom he is greatly attached. Time as Shiva wears on his bosom of the world the triple white and holy thread composed of the serpent named Ananta, infinite, and the Ganges River, and on his forehead the digit of the moon, that is the zodiac belt, the Milky Way and the lunar astrological divisions and phases. 
The sun and the moon are the golden armlets of time, who holds the mundane world in its palms like the paltry plaything of a flower bouquet. The sky with its stars appear like a garment with colored spots. The clouds called Pushkaka, Pushkara and Avarta are like the skirts of that garment washed by time in the waters of the universal deluge. Before him, his lovely destiny with all her arts forever dances to beguile the living who are fond of worldly enjoyments. People hurry up and down to the witness of the dance of destiny whose unrestrained emotion keeps them at work and causes their repeated births and deaths. People of all worlds are studied like ornaments about their person and the sky stretching upon the heaven of gods to the infernal region serves for the veil on her head. His feet are planted in the infernal regions and the hell pits ring at her feet like trinkets tied by the string of evil deeds and sin. The god Chitragupa has painted her from head to foot with ornamental masks prepared by her attendants and perfumed with the essence of those deeds. She dances and reels at the nod of her husband at the end of the Kalpas and makes the mountains crack and crash at her footfalls. Behind her dance, the peacocks of the god Kumara, Subramanian, and Kala, the god of death, staring with three wide open eyes, utters his hideous cries of destruction. Death dances about in the form of the five-headed Hara, the destroyer, Shiva, with the loosened braids of his hair upon him, while destiny in the form of Gauri, Shiva's consort, her locks adorned with Mandara flowers, keeps her pace with him. In her war dance, this destiny bears a large gourd resembling her big belly and her body is adorned with hundreds of hollow human skulls, jingling like the alms pot of Kapali mendicants. She has filled the sky with the emaciated skeleton of her body and her terrible destructive figure. The various shapes of skulls of the dead adorn her body like a beautiful garland of lotuses. They sway to and fro during her dance at the end of a Kalpa age. The horrible roaring of the giddy clouds which Kara and Avarta at the end of the Kalpa serves to represent the beating of her Damaru drum and puts to flight the heavenly choir of Tamburu. As death dances along, the moon appears by his earrings, and the moonbeams star and stars appear like his crest made of peacock's feathers. The snow-capped Himalayas appear like a crown of bones in the upper loop of his right ear. And Mount Meru has a golden ring on his left. Under their lobes and suspended, the moon and sun like pendant earrings glittering over his cheeks. The mountain ranges called the Loka Loka are fastened like chains around his waist. Lightning bolts are the bracelets and armlets of destiny, which move to and fro as she dances along. The clouds are her dressing gown that fly about in the air. We'll stop here, continuing verse 26 tomorrow. 
to a great death.